Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Brain Market, a poll for seed businesses across bean corridors in Tanzania. I am Michael Seltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar, and our Q&A will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of your window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Rob Bertram. Thank you, Michael, and greetings, everyone. Great to be back on with Agrilinks. Um, it's always fun because we, we get a worldwide audience here. We have people across uh, practically every time zone. There's probably a few in the middle of the we don't have with the Atlantic. Anyway, welcome. and. Uh, so today we're going to be uh, learning about uh, Feed the Future's Global Supporting Seed Systems for Development, better known as S34D, which is led by uh, uh, Catholic Relief Services uh, along with a consortium of partners. And what we're going to be focusing on today is the really dynamic uh, market that exists for seed in uh, Tanzania and the surrounding countries where they're very well-established seed corridors uh, that, that, that span the whole region. And yellow beans in particular are one of the most traded types, I think reflecting their high demand and, and perhaps adaptative qualities as well. And there's a huge market pull for seed. And uh, basically what we find is that there are three distinct seed sectors that do integrate. Uh, one, well, there's an integrated one, and there's a primary one in formal and one in informal, and then the two coming together. And our panelists today are going to basically tell us about that system uh, and the findings of the yellow bean studies that aim to characterize and explore business and investment opportunities. So this is this is not about plant breeding today, this, and this is about the real seed business that exists and its dynamism. We're going to hear about how traders uh, creatively engage both the informal and formal systems, including how they source and then ensure quality standards, and how the seed business is really a lucrative complement to the huge uh, bean grain market that exists in that region. Just for those who aren't necessarily familiar, East Africa, especially in the highlands, is the uh, highest bean consuming uh, per capita in a region in the world. So this is a critical element of diet quality, micronutrient nutrition, food security, and as we're going to hear, livelihoods. Um, our panelists are going to share their experiences on demand-led seed systems and how these seed systems are are speeding the dissemination of improved climate resilient uh, farmer and market demanded varieties. Um, before I introduce our terrific lineup of speakers, I just want to say that for, for the AgriLinks community, you may notice that we, we visit the topic of seed fairly frequently. There's a reason for that. Seed is the means by which farmers, consumers, uh, and all of us benefit from all the innovation that's occurring, not all of it, excuse me, but from much of the innovation that is occurring. And in a climate challenged world where both abiotic stresses but also pests and diseases are, are spreading and, and, and changing, uh, there's the, the importance of being able to access these innovations in the package of a quality seed that has both genetic value, but also quality seed value, both are critical, is, is something that's it's so encouraging and it's so necessary that we see this. And it's especially exciting today because this is a self-pollinated crop where all of us know that those crops have had often struggled. And yet here we see an incredibly dynamic 
uh, a seed system that's a value proposition for everyone involved. So it's it, this is a critical piece of Africa and, and more globally being ready for a changing environment that farmers face and and uh, and ensuring food security and better nutrition for all and especially those who rely on these uh, things like beans that are uh, affordable but <clears throat> excuse me deliver such important nutrition so now turning to our terrific lineup of speakers we will be starting with dr eliud uh Hirachi, and he is the project leader at the Alliance for Biodiversity, Biodiversity International and SEAT. He's a um, market economist and value chain specialist under PABRA, which is the Pan-Africa Bean Research Alliance, and which has, as an organization has done such, with, with many partners, has done such great work in this whole space of both research and seed systems. Um, he's interested, <coughs> excuse me, in linking farmers to markets and agro-enterprise development, again, reflecting the business dimension of this work. Uh, and recently, he's been focusing on ag commercialization, gender empowerment, and rural employment, all things we talk about around AID, and I think probably many of you talk about all the time. Then we'll hear from Louise Sperling. I think we might say Louise is a household name in this whole space. Uh, she has been involved for decades and leading in, in particularly in the issues of um, seed systems under stress, but also I would say more informal and very dynamic seed systems generally. So she looks at uh, smallholder farmer systems. Uh, she's, she's worked across uh, crisis environments like Rwanda after the genocide, uh, post earthquake in Haiti, uh, South Sudan and, and others. And um, she uh, is, is a, hugely published author and um, has uh, been seedsystems.org is where you can read more about the kinds of involved the advice and policy insights that she shares with the global community. Then we'll hear from a private sector colleague, Ms. Gaudencia Bakilile, and she's the general manager of the G2L Company Limited. And her work spans uh, grade trading, including common beans, rice, and maize. Uh, so, you know, the maize is there, but so are two self-pollinated crops. It's really exciting. And they work with uh, uh, over 3,000 uh, smallholder farmers, half of whom are, almost are women, on a, con a contract farming basis in order to source their seed. And they support and supply a quality declared seed and fertilizer, but also, and this is a great piece of this, this, this commercialization of the system, agricultural advisory services, product aggregation, loans, management, including uh, smallholders and linking them to financial institutions for input loans and, and, and they provide training. So what a fantastic set of, of, of contributions to bring to this whole ecosystem. Then we'll hear from one of our NARS partners, Dr. Godfried Macamilo, and he's the Director General of the Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute. Uh, he has a PhD in production ecology and resource conservation, and he, his work has particularly focused on cassava, uh, another incredibly, incredibly vegetatively uh, prop, important crop, vegetatively propagated important crop in the region. Um, and he also uh, provides insights to policymakers and um, and and. Uh, has involved, been involved in many international collaborations, including, for example, with uh, the CGIAR centers. Uh, then uh, Jeff Ellers uh, uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he's the program officer leading their work on legumes. And uh, Jeff had worked for many years at IITA in Africa before pursuing a research career at the University of California at Riverside. And um, he has, I think, been a, a real force for moving legumes to the fore, something that Feed the Future has prioritized since its inceptions because of their critical importance for nutrition, for profits, incomes, for uh, environmental uh, sustainability in terms of uh, improving the soil and so forth. And then finally, to wind us up, we'll hear from the head of PABRA, Jean-Claude Rubiogo, 
and he is the leader of, of the, the BEAM program uh, and director of PABRA at the um, International Center for Tropical Agriculture and the Alliance of Biodiversity International. And he's been involved in this work for, for many decades. It's been a real pleasure to have this uh, partnership for us at USAID with Jean-Claude and the, the rest of his colleagues at, at PABRA. And I think he has built PABRA along with all the partners into a shining example of how global public goods research can integrate into the, the, the real systems that make a difference in the daily lives, which is what it's all about. So thanks. And I'm going to turn it now to our first speaker, Dr. Eliud Birachi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rob, uh, for the introduction and laying really the, the foundation for these presentations. Uh, I'm going to share this presentation and this first part which I'm sharing is about the grain, but my colleague Luis is going to share the component on the seed systems for the yellow bean. So we will begin with the first slide. Next. So as an overview, we have three key items that we'll be looking at. We have the introduction and then share the resource and then the lessons and implications that we learn from this study. Now the map on your right indicates the bean corridors that Abra has focused on over the last few years and these are in total nine of them and at the center is the yellow bean corridor which is the focus of these presentations next so we will begin with the first part in the next slide so uh, i think Barbara has already been introduced by bob and i do not need to uh, reintroduce or talk about it. But basically, Fabra works in 31 countries in three networks, as highlighted by the map West and Central Africa, and then East and Central Africa in green, and in yellow is the Southern Africa network. So, Fabra implements the bean work on behalf of the Alliance uh, of Biodiversity and SEAT in Africa. Next. So the study overall had six objectives. Uh, first, understanding the importance of the yellow bean in Tanzania and the region. Uh, next, understanding the capacity of traders and seed networks. Uh, thirdly, showing the position of released varieties in the market. And fourth, assessing demand for yellow bean seed and grain. Fifth, identifying opportunities for enhancing efficiency through policy and practice. And sixth, guiding public and private investments in the yellow bean. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to focus on the uh, objectives as they relate to this grain component. And my colleague, Luis, will be presenting on the seed component next. So bean and Tanzania are quite synonymous. It is the largest bean producer in Africa and seventh globally. 1.2 million tons are produced uh, on average per year. And this contributes immensely to nutrition, of, that's food security and nutrition, but also to the incomes. So on the income side, 40% of these beans are traded, of which 25% reach the regional markets as well as exports so being really uh, very important in the country next so we are focusing on the yellow bean so why yellow bean now from this chart currently yellow bean stands at number two in the bean types of market classes in tanzania and we are seeing up to 340 metric tons uh, up to more than 340,000 hectares that are planted under this bin, and it occupies, which is almost at 2% of the total 
bean area in the country. Ten years ago, the yellow bean was not as important as it is now. And there are reasons that we are going to look into for this fast rising uh, bean type and in the market. Next. So, why did we focus on yellow bean? Now, first of all, yellow bean is the, one of the most traded bean types in the in Tanzania, but then it has limited information on its production and trade. So that means that the potential implications of this trade on seed supplies and other possible investments remain unclear. So this motivated our focus on this yellow bean uh, that we are sharing here. Next. So as our background, we focused on a survey of 340 traders, both grain and informal seed. And these were from 12 regions of the country. And these regions are indicated in the map. So some of these regions, of the, many of these regions are major production areas uh, and consumption areas of the yellow bean corridor. So that is our main focus. Uh, for the study, so more or less covering the whole country of Tanzania, especially for this yellow bean. And this was a partnership led by, uh, co-led by Chari and Pabra. And we are happy for the support under the S34D and fit the feature that enabled this work. Next. So let's see about some of the results that we found out in this study in the next slide. So from the 340 grain traders that we surveyed, they were found to be trading or handling about 40 or more than 40,000 metric tons of grain valued at 27 million uh, US dollars. So, and this trade, of course, also includes what went to the export or regional markets. And we found about 17,000 metric tons valued at about 12 million trading in the region as well. The map on the right shows the major production areas or production hubs. These are in the deeper colors. And then, of course, flowing from these production areas or hubs into the major consumption hubs. So these movements really reflect the versatility of this yellow bean uh, trade in the country. Next. So we have major production areas as shown on the map, but from this chart here, Igoma and Kagera come out as top production areas for yellow beans in the country, but there are others such as Rupa, Jombe, and so on. And the major consumption areas or market areas being Dar es Salaam, Shinyanga, and other major urban areas. There are some of these regions that are both consumption and production. But what to note here is that some of these regions, such as Arusha, uh, Manyara, these are recent yellow bean areas and could potentially really be much bigger in the coming years also. Next. So yellow bean is not just one bean type or one variety. There are a number of bean varieties. In this case, we are giving examples of a cluster of about six or seven. And there are various or there is differentiation varieties. And these varieties have distinct uh, preferences among the traders and the consumers. But what you can see on the right hand side is that there is also differentiation in terms of prices. Some yellow bean varieties fetch relatively higher prices, such as the Stellium 13, which is relatively recent also, and others relatively lower, for example, Jano Gololi. So this simply shows that yellow bean is also highly differentiated with distinct preferences, both in the, among consumers and traders. Next. Now, we also see very strong uh, gender dimension in the bean trade. And women are 
systematically trading in uh, retail, while men are dominating the export and the aggregate or aggregation level businesses. But it's not only the type of business, rather also the, the, the value of the trade is almost uh, double among the men compared to uh, the women. And this, of course, has implications of how we support also the women to enhance their value in this, uh, their trade value in these uh, businesses. Next. So what are some of the lessons and implications that we get from this study? These are shown in the next slide. So first of all, we see that there is high demand and rapid growth in the yellow bean over the last 10 years. But the major driver for this being the test, palatability, vigilance, fast cooking, among other trades that are really highly, highly preferred by consumers and therefore traders respond to this. There is differentiated grain market and this preference for single varieties. There is a premium price, of course, if the prices are single and some of those markets also fetch higher prices. We also see that the market pool for yellow bean varieties is still quite strong. But then the traders also still face some um, uh, constraints and some of these include inadequate supply to meet the demands. We also see that the grain market lays a good foundation for investments by private and public sector actors, whether it's informal or informal. But to be able to take advantage of these opportunities for investment, uh, we need to overcome some coin strains and some of these are listed here. For example, unreliable supply of grain is still a challenge. Inadequate seed and poor linkages to research is still a challenge that needs to be worked on. Poor quality of bean needs also uh, to be attended to, as well as the unpredictable market levies, storage and credit challenges. So these need some attention in order, in order to enhance some of these investments. Next. So finally, what we can say for the yellow bean is that there is large volumes of trade of the trade of, of trade in this bean, but then these large volumes need also to translate into business and investment opportunities in order to upgrade seed supplies especially by enterprises for growth and gender inclusion. To be able to achieve these uh, positive outcomes, there is need to invest in several areas. One of the areas is provision of variety information to potential users, which was a challenge as shown by the results. Another area is this need to increase technical capacities of the different value chain actors to handle uh, bean seeds and as well as grain. There is also need to increase collaborations and linkages in the value chain as a whole. And finally here, there is need to provide sufficient policy support for within and cross border trade. So these are potential investment areas that can enhance this yellow bean corridor. So finally, what we see here is that yellow bean corridor success is not just about grain movement as we are focused on grain, but that is not just about it. It is also about informal seed movement. It is about supporting informal seed availability, access and quality enhancement. However, on these issues of the seed, we are going to see in the, my colleague Luis is going to make a presentation or about the seed or the seed issues and the seed uh, results that relate to this yellow bean in the next presentation that follows here. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, good morning, everyone.
Thank you, Elliot. And please do ask questions of Elliot in the Q&A box. So Elliot just covered grain. This presentation is going to focus on seed. And of course, seed is one of the main drivers of the yellow bean chain in Tanzania. Next. OK, some clarifications on terminology. Um, as you know, smallholder farmers use two types of seed systems, at least. There's the formal system, and that's the yellow bars at top. That's modern, modern variety certified seed. And this might come from government or from commercial companies or from relief. Then there's the informal system, also known as farmer system, traditional system, local system. And that's the brown cylinders at the bottom. And that's seed that comes from farmers' own harvests, social networks, or local markets. You know, we emphasize in this yellow bean chain that both formal and informal um, seed systems are really important and that we aim to support both. Next. Just to clarify, on the right, you see uh, an agro dealer, a formal seed market. This often sells maize and vegetable seed. On the left, you see um, an informal market. Here you find many crops cereals, legumes, even the vegetatively propagated crops. Next. Finally, in terms of terminology, many of you use the phrase improved seed. You know, at PABRA, we feel this is really not precise enough. And as Rob said in his introduction, there are two aspects that need to be separated. There's seed quality. So is it certified QDS or farmers? And then there's the genetic. Is it performing varieties? Is it modern? Is it improved? Is it local? So let's keep these two varieties, two varieties, two aspects distinct as we move to talk about seed. And here below, we just want to show you that in Tanzania for the yellow beans, seed quality is variable. But particularly variable is the genetic quality. Here you see 12 different types of yellows. We know there are at least 20. And you see it kind of goes from white to brown. It's a real mix and a very interesting mix. Next. So Elliot taught, showed you the slide, and this is our methodology. Um, I want to emphasize that we did interview 340 traders. This included large grain traders, people who identified as large seed traders, and even seed retailers. In addition, we did extensive GIS mapping of seed and grain flows. Are they the same? Are they different? And then finally, we did um, DNA and fingerprinting analysis. So that this yellow bean study goes well beyond survey. It's really a set of comprehensive interlinked methods. Next. Okay, let's get to the findings. Um, what about seed in the seed business? Next. So first, what we find that it's not seed and then grain business. It's both. They're intertwined. A trader normally does seed and grain business. Seed business does have a seasonality. So you look at the, the, um, the graphic at the top. You know, of course, seed business goes up during sowing season. But what surprised us is that the seed business is also year round. So look at the graph at the bottom. During the sowing period, you know, a large trader moves grain and seed, but at least 33, a whole third of his or her business is seed. But even during the non sowing period, traders also sell seed. And you see it's about 15 to 20 percent of their business. And this is because you know, smallholders are looking for seed all year round. They want a good variety. They want a good quality seed whenever they can get it. Particularly surprising for us was the volume. You look at the, um, the left column there. Our average large trader moved 48 metric tons a year. Next. Traders aren't just moving grain. They're actively moving informal seed. Here, we're, we're summarizing some of the practices that traders use 
to get better quality seed. And there are 12 here. So for instance, you see they get grain from specific regions. They might seek out specific varieties. They might buy from specific growers who are known for high quality seed. What surprised us that is on average, a large trader pays a great deal of attention to seed. You might see that he or she uses on average 6.7 practices. So, so why do traders care about local seed? Because it makes them money. So the seed um, margin over grain is always 10 to 25%. And for some varieties, it can even be 50%. And we have just a, so you can see we have highlighted in yellow places where there are gaps. Um, most traders do not do germination tests. That's an area to be improved. Most traders also do not ask growers to multiply select varieties. Although you're going to see that our next speaker, Guadencia, she does do this. So there's lots of room for improvement, but there's also lots of dynamism. Next. Okay, here we look again at seed and grain flows. You see they're different. Grain flows for yellow bean, as Elliot said, they're countrywide and they even go across borders. You see that seed flows, and that's the, the darker line, are much more localized. Next. This slide confirms that seed sourcing and sale tends to be local. And this makes total sense because you buy seed from a trader you trust, and you also want adapted varieties. Okay, all of this says to us that, 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 that traders don't just deal in grain, and farmers don't sow grain. And people who say that farmers are sowing grain, you know, frankly, you're scientifically wrong, but you're also business-wise wrong. You're business blind, because local seed is a great investment opportunity. Next. Finally, we did ask traders where they sourced their seed and grain. And there are many different uh, venues from which they can source. You can see there's their own production. They can get it from farmers directly. They source from collectors. They source from other traders. They source from wholesalers. And all of this is seed. Um, what surprised us with the yellow bean is that among the 340 traders, so a very large sample countrywide, None had directly sourced seed from seed companies, none from QDS producers, none from research. We'll get to this later. But So we have a situation here. We have a very dynamic yellow bean trade. At this point, it's 100% informal seed. That's only part of the equation next. Now, that was the seed quality part, let's look at the varieties. So what are, what are yellow bean traders using? Next. Next, thank you, thanks. So we did extensive work on the genetic composition of these yellow bean varieties. And I particularly want to signal the excellent work of, of Claire Mukankuse and her team who did this work. You know, basically what they did, um, they established a reference library all the Tari varieties, what is the genetic composition? And they then compared the Tari varieties with those samples that we had collected from traders. Um, we collected 501 samples, very large. And then these were analyzed not only in Tanzania, but also in Uganda and also in Sweden to get a really good sense of the genetic profile. Next. Okay, so here we are, a big surprise. These are the trader samples. The varieties are grouped, as you see, into six groups. Look at the types. So that's the column towards the right. Some are land rices, but most are modern. In fact, 61%, over 61% of the trader samples were modern varieties. Equally surprising, look at the release dates. You see Uyole 16, that was released in 216, sorry, 2016. Look at Selian and Unjanu Gololi, 
These were released in 2018, just one year before our study took place. So yes, we have a situation where it's 100% informal seed, but it's informal seed that is dynamically diffusing modern varieties and quickly. So modern varieties at scale, modern varieties quickly. This is what variety turnover is about. Next. So how did modern varieties enter the informal system? Now remember, we don't have direct evidence, we didn't have direct links, but TARI and other processes have been going on dynamically, and let's share some of them with you. So, so TARI, and the director is here, very welcome, sir. TARI, between 2011 and 2020, released 15 different bean varieties. Very, very dynamic. Toski, the, um, the seed agency, took seriously scaling up. So you see that in 2013, um, for QDS and certified, it was 2.2 metric tons. After that, every year, it was 300 to 500 metric tons. And then of course, there are many on-farm demonstrations, there are field days. So this is a dynamic research and seed system. And now we have to connect it better to the informal system. Next. So moving forward, next, you know, we have a great case um, with the yellow beans. We're at scale, it's fast, it seems to be working well, but what can we do better? And so we'd like to signal three different areas for action. One on information, second on strategic injection of new varieties, and third on seed quality, how to enhance the seed quality. And these are quite distinct thrusts of action. Next. So for information, oh, thanks very much. For information, you know, basically with traders, we have to actively link traders to info on new varieties. It has to be a two-way information system. What about the new varieties? How are they different? What are the specific sources of quality seed? We have to ensure that traders are actually represented on commodity platforms, on seed grain platforms, not just the formal sector, but also the informal trading sector. And also, you know, finally, it makes sense to give traders real tools to popularize and give feedback on varieties. I mean, traders should be involved in research. They can be involved in PVS trials. I know Gates and Bioversity are doing some really interesting work on a thousand farms. Traders can and should influence research. Okay, next, going to injection of new varieties. Thanks very much. So, you know, for injection of new varieties, we need an active, not a passive strategy. You know, it's not just about varieties working their way somehow into the local system. You know, we have to map points of intervention to make it go faster and wider and more varieties. And actually, I for one would be fascinated very willing to work with the team who says, what does it mean? What are the actions to get new varieties, not certified seed? How do we get new varieties into the informal system? And then of course, the third area of action, next please, is on seed quality. Um, here we want to distinguish two things. We do have to leverage areas for bringing certified seed we're working with special producers and bringing this into the informal system. So one thing to do is, of course, to, to scale up formal seed and get it into the informal system. Equally, however, we really have to think about improving quality, seed quality of the informal system itself. You know, we should be working with farmers and traders to keep variety separate. We should be working to promote better storage with farmers and traders, and maybe even to, you know, improving informal system seed selection techniques. Oops. Um, again, we're looking at an agenda here. It looks ambitious, but our feeling is that all these actions can be accomplished in the next one to four years. Next. So well, finally, we have a great situation with the yellow bean in Tanzania. Um, where are we going now? Well, for our immediate next steps, um, we'd like to expand in Tanzania to other bean types, you know, to the whatever it is, the reds, the models, just other bean types. But equally, we want to try the yellow bean approach with other crops. Cowpea is a good entry point. 
there might be other good entry points. Beyond beans, though, beyond beans and other crops, I think we have to put much more emphasis on learning about the seed flow processes. We know there's an informal sector, we know there's a formal sector, but what do we know about their real interactions? How can we spur these interactions? How can we make them more efficient? And then what we should do is move this learning to other parts of Africa and even beyond. Next. Very frankly here, with the yellow bean, we seem to have a real win situation. And at this point with the seed, there's been very little or even no outside investment. Surprising, amazing, um, something to reflect on. Next. Finally, there are so many people who helped drive this study, and I you know, particularly want to thank Tari um, and Pabra, and there are many researchers on the ground. But beyond that, there are 340 traders who we interviewed who are making this system work. You know, I wish we could list all of their names. And you know, often we think about the traders as enemy, the traders as those who are in competition with the formal system. I think it's time, and we all think it's time, to embrace, to move, to collaborate with traders as, as true partners, because frankly, they're the dynamism moving not just beans, but other crops you know, through the corridors of Africa. Um, and with that, I'd like to move um, to have you listen and, and learn from one amazing trader. So, Quardencia, it's up to you quite now. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Luis, for the presentation and the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for engaging G2L in this meeting on today's agenda, Grain Market Approval for Seed Business Across Bean Cold Doors in Tanzania. My name is Gaudencia Bakirile, working with G2L Company as the general manager. G2L is an agro-processing and trading company based in Southern Highland of Tanzania. The company is legally registered in Tanzania. Next, please. Next, please. G2L products. Uh, our company trade maize, flour, rice, soybean, common beans, uh, and the rice. The market for our product is within Tanzania, around East Africa region, and Congo DRC. But as for today, I'm going to talk more on common beans, which take about 25% of uh, the company business. The company work close uh, with smallholder farmers of Njombe, Ruvuma, Iringa, and Mbea region. Uh, the company, uh, company deals with two varieties, which are yellow bean, Jano Uyole, and lady kidney, Uyole 96, with its 6,000 metric ton capacity, as shown in the picture below. Next, please. In this map, shows the stakeholders who involved in common beans in the in whole value chain uh, from access of input production to the market. There is high potential for bean production in this area. On green uh, cycle is where G12 located at Makambako. A green star is where Tari Uyole located, and the small red cycle is seed pro uh, producer located. Seed production is supported by Tari Uyole and other development partners like uh, Beula Seed Company, smallholder farmers of Clinton Foundation and Nafaka, who produce QDS. Next, please. Our mode of work, uh, G12 calls with smallholder farmers, research institution like Tal Uyole, seed company like Beula Seed Company, QDS producer like uh, smallholder farmers of Clinton Foundation and Nafaka, banks, agro dealers, and the local government authority. In this, in this model, G2L, uh, G2L, with support from Tal Uyole, we provide capacity building to smallholder farmer, demonstration plot, and conduct field days whereby at least 7,485 7, smallholder farmers receive training of, of them, 41% are women. The company engage into contract farming with smallholder farmers through their groups and link smallholder farmers with banks to access input loan 
and at least 45% access input loans since 2019 from the trained farmers groups. The company links smallholder farmer with CD producer. The company also is a market of the farm produce. G2L also pays smallholder farmers through the bank's account to recover their loan. On smallholder, uh, smallholder activities, in this model, they sign buying selling contracts with G2L. They access input loan from banks with support from G2L. They submit their input demand and work code with G2L to access seed and the fertilizer from the input supplier. They produce and sell common beans to G2L at the quality and quantity agreed on the contract and at the market price. Bank activity in this model, they confirm the name of smallholder farmers and their groups with G2L. They do bank procedure to provide loan to smallholder farmer. They pay seed companies after G2L confirm that the farmer have already received the input. They provide other bank service to smallholder farmers, like opening bank agent, agents called Wakala at their village to access the bank service. Uh, on research institution side, uh, seed company, QDS producer and agro deal activity in this model, uh, I, I will start with the research company. Uh, research institution uh, is in collaboration with G12, they conduct capacity building, assist variety development and seed certified. They prepare and deliver inputs to smallholder farmers as requested on performa invoice and they submit the invoice to the bank for payment arrangement. Local government activity in this model, they sign contracts with, as witness to the uh, farmers group and they assure the banks and the company that this group is registered at local government level. Also, local government assist on all matters regarding smallholder farmers. Even though in this model, uh, there are still some farmers who use grain as a seed. Next, please. Challenges. Uh, we still face a lack of a coordinated multi stakeholder platform. Currently, you'll find that the current place they are ordered of different variety during the harvest time and not during the plantation. Also, inadequacy of quantity of early generation seed. The climate change still is a challenge for us, especially this year we experienced excess rain, which leads to low harvesting of, of bean, common beans. COVID-19, last year we lose and failed to secure our contracts due to pandemic and disease lead us to fail to meet company revenue target and hence a working capital challenge. The we only 96 red kidney beans uh, discover and they are not suitable for our international market. The company still face challenge on participation of women in business. Women are trustful but they are shy and afraid to engage into contract. Also we lack youth participation in agriculture, still low. Inadequate equipment like duster cleaner, dryer, grading, and sorting machine is still the challenge to all of us. Next, please. Way forward. As a company, we uh, will continue to work close with Stalu Yole and the other research institutions to have better variety of sugar and dark lady kidney because of higher demand, and at least 45% of common beans to be used to process instant food. Uh, especially common beans with uh, zinc and high iron. Also to strengthen multi-stakeholder platform to support the coordination of key actors, to continue linking smallholder farmers with financial institutions for easy access of financing uh, input. Also increase the participation of women and youth in common beans production, assist, uh, and lastly to assist the legislation of farmer groups and reach new potential areas for common bean production. Next. Thank you, uh, Asante Sana. Let me welcome Dr. Geoffrey Makilo. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, my name is Geoffrey Makilo, Director General of Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute based in Dodoma, Tanzania. Next. Uh, Previous speakers have already given detailed introduction about beans, but probably I should uh, shorten a bit. And I would like you to introduce that uh, Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute 
as a total of 17 centers and we are dealing over 45 commodities including being. Now being in Tanzania uh, is, is actually supported by three centers namely Tari Uyole, which is based in the southern highland of Tanzania and then the Tari Maruku Bukoba uh, in the lake and the western zone and also Tari Serian uh, in the northern zone. Next. Uh, just to share again with you impactful partnership. Basically, uh, Tari, we believe on partnership. We cannot work alone. We have to work with the national, regional, international uh, institutions and organizations, including uh, development partners. And in being over 35 years, basically we have worked, been working together with the Alliance of Biodiversity International and the CIAD through Pan-African Bean Research. This is since 1986. So this is over uh, 35 uh, years. Now in this collaboration or partnership, actually we have registered some of achievements, you can see the achievement, which are in bullet, and uh, such as and one is the development of new beans varieties. We have over 49 bean varieties that you have been, uh, we, we, we have released it together in collaboration with the ABC Pabra. But again, we are testing being corridor approach, which is increasingly generating interest from government investment in beans and increasing upgrading bean value chain. But again, uh, if we talk of the city companies producing bean seed, now in 2015, we just recorded one company, but now uh, in 2021, there are uh, 13 companies that are producing bean seed. So this is becoming very, very interesting. But again, if you look at the seed production, uh, we, we take 2015 as a baseline. Uh, basically, we see uh, only 542.7 metric tons of seeds were produced. So these are seed, certified seeds, and, and uh, quality declared seeds, and also other classes of seeds. Now, in 2020, we registered uh, 1,932.4 metric tons. What it means here that being uh, seed production uh, becomes of interest and uh, many companies really uh, may, may make, make investment in this. But again, being yield, if you talk of being yield, um, was less than uh, one, uh, one metric tons per hectare, that is in 2012, but now uh, we have increased uh, productivity uh, up to 1.3 metric tons. This is according to the information in 2019. But yeah, we also have benefited from capacity building uh, from these initiatives. The National Agricultural uh, Research System, basically we have benefited from long-term training uh, in terms of masters and PhD, and also some tailor, tailor-made programs and uh, other value chain actors also have, uh, have benefited from the training and we acknowledge also for this support and also partnership. Next. Now, what is the implication of this yellow bean? So our, my, my colleagues have already given details about the, the yellow bean, but uh, uh, let, let me just share with you some of the implications of the yellow bean. Uh, one is raise the profile of beans in the country from subsistence to cash crop and attracted a different investment in the value chain. Uh, what it means here, initially being was considered as a subsistence crop, but now being is regarded as a cash crop and the many uh, companies actually making a lot of profit from it. Two is a government investment in beans actually in collaboration with the other partner. In collaboration, as I have said, with the ABC, Pabra, and again, some donors like IFAD, BMGF, and so on. 
uh, we see a lot of really investment uh, going on uh, because of the importance of the, the crop at the moment. But again, commodity approach, basically uh, in our centers, we really use the commodity approach. So you can have a center which is clearly focusing on being and trying to address all the value chains associated with the crop. <clears throat> but again, when it comes to breeding, uh, these days basically we, we don't just do breeding for the breeding, it has to be demand rate so that in the end what you, uh, you breed and finally you release, you release a product which is required uh, or preferred by consumers and also farmers. Then you synchronize with the seed system, that means you multiply that seed, which is, whether it's multiplied by a public institution like a cultural seed agents or some companies, and finally the seed is available to a small holder farmer. But again, the grain market, uh, production market, uh, my colleagues uh, have already uh, discussed about this. Next. So the way forward here, that you will catalyze the mainstream in good lessons uh, of this commodity. But again, um, as the, also previous speakers have already uh, discussed about the popular model, which is really an example of a partnership uh, between uh, NAS, in this case, Itali, and also the CG. And it is now interesting to find out that the centers uh, now are becoming in one CG in order to really address problems affecting uh, our, our farmers. So basically, this is really an exemplary. But I also want to point out <coughs> that uh, uh, this is the one CG and there also some regional organization like ACR House, some regional organization like Yasareka, basically we really, uh, very, very important that we really work together in order to uh, address these issues together, especially in being and also some other uh, commodities. That is open also to new uh, ideas and ready to equity partners uh, to continue to address all the challenges that is slowing down the agricultural sector growth. Uh, we also want to extend our sincere appreciation to all donors. Basically here, I really wanted to cite donors who actually have contributed a lot in the development of being, and also some other other crops. Uh, we wanted to really to recognize uh, the Gacy Foundation. The Gacy Foundation actually <clears throat> is a key in, try, in trying to transform agricultural sector in Tanzania. I also want to register the contribution of USAID, the contribution of Switzerland, uh, Development Corporation, the contribution of Global Affairs Canada, the contribution of Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. Over time, basically, we have been uh, getting support from our development partners, and we really appreciate for this contribution. Next. Finally, thank you very much, Asante San. Hello, everyone. Oh. Hello, everyone. Uh, shall I continue? Yes. Yes, please, Jeff. I'll go yeah. right ahead. I'm yes. sorry. We're yeah, off. thank you. Thank you. I wasn't sure if uh, there was an introduction coming. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be part of this uh, webinar and uh, contribute a few thoughts uh, on the on potentially on the way ahead um, and and what we see uh, from these studies from the sort of donor perspective. Uh, 
uh, I think there's just so many lessons that came out of this yellow bean study that are really opening our eyes. Um, you know, we heard from from Rob and other speakers how dynamic this yellow bean market is, and I think that contributed to the quick success uh, and uh, maybe was one of the big enabling factors. But even still, uh, I think the lessons will apply to uh, a broader case of, of varieties and, and even crops, as, as Louise mentioned. So we, we think this uh, study was, was really critical in uh, helping us understand the relationship between uh, an informal system that's actually providing most of the seed that farmers actually plant and the formal system that most donors have been actually working with. And I think uh, to a large extent, um, donors and, and their projects have been somewhat blind to this informal system. And so this study really opened our eyes, I think, to the power of, of linking with the informal system. And uh, I, I guess when we look at our, our previous efforts uh, as, as donors and, and their projects, you know, we see the, the form, just to illustrate this, this point, uh, you know, we see that these donor-led projects are often only getting us, even after 10 years or so, to this level of sort of 10% um, or even less uh, of, of seed being available to farmers, their planting seed coming through the formal sec sector. And yet, uh, what this study showed is that very rapidly, new varieties can be scaled uh, very quickly by, by, by mechanisms that were somewhat invisible um, to, to those of us maybe on the outside. So, you know, following up from uh, Louise's point about, you know, what, what we can do looking forward, I think uh, there's an opportunity to uh, increase these linkages with this informal system uh, using, uh, you know, one of, one of the ideas I'd like to explore with, with uh, Eliud and, and JC and Louise is, you know, connecting all of this, all of these informal traders uh, digitally, getting them on a digital platform, understanding who they are, uh, linking them to information, for example, uh, linking them to sources of, of information about them uh, being able to increase the quality of the products they have. Uh, potentially, maybe some could gain a QDS type status so they could become actual uh, seed producers and, and be legal uh, sellers of, of seed under, under different, uh, under the seed laws. Um, so we think there's, there's some real possibilities uh, to move forward uh, beyond yellow beans and really make this uh, part of the way we would work um, in, in terms of our seed work. And we think that way we can uh, somewhat duplicate this yellow bean success story and get uh, really accelerate the, the varietal turnover that we can achieve. And, and we feel this is, uh, you know, a rapid varietal turnover is going to be a primary way that we help farmers uh, adapt to a, cl a changing climate. Um, the the you know, we still are in a situation with many crops in most uh, African uh, geographies that, you know, the varieties are, are 20 or more years old. And we know the climate has shifted since then, and it will continue to shift. And so we think the best possible uh, outcome would be for, is, is to have a dynamic seed system wherein varieties are, uh, or farmers are actually circulating in and circulating out varieties you know, at a five or 10 year interval and taking advantage of, of varieties that are bred in the current environment. So we think these kinds of uh, mechanisms where we can leverage and, and empower this informal system can be uh, really powerful uh, looking ahead. Um, um, yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, I was just really excited. There's just so much here. I, I took really good notes and I think, uh, uh, can really learn a lot. I, I hope all of you uh, uh, similarly uh, can now appreciate this informal informal system if you haven't been part of it. Um, and again, I think it's going to be relevant across uh, all the pure line uh, crops, um, things like cowpeas uh, in West Africa, maybe sorghum, uh, for sure things like rice. Um, I did a little 
uh, academic research uh, a few weeks ago, and I looked at the rice value chain, for example, and I was looking at some old literature, and the the system looks very similar. So I think it's a lot of these findings are going to be useful uh, for a wide range of, of commodities if we can understand this informal system better and empower it to uh, to get access to new varieties and information and increase the quality of, of uh, the quality and purity of the of the uh, seed products that they work on. So I think uh, I think that's my my primary message. Uh, maybe instead of uh, continuing to talk, I'll I'll turn it back to the organizers. Uh, but thank you very much for allowing me a few minutes to uh, opine in from the donor side. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to now pass it off to Rob Bertram to lead us through a Q&A for about 20 minutes. And uh, we'll be answering some of your questions. Thank you so much. Are we starting the Q&A now? Yes, we are, Rob. Take it away. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I had to step away for just a second. I thought, did Jean-Claude speak yet? No, Jean-Claude will be speaking at the end. Uh, oh, I missed at... that. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Okay, everybody. Well, there's been a very lively uh, uh, chat and questions going on. I'm going to try to start. I tried to, to sort these. Um, first of all, um, the question of distinguishing varieties, which would be, I think, something that would have impacts on a number of things that we've talked about this morning. Um, can I pass that one to, um, let's see, maybe either uh, Gaudencia might want to comment on that, and maybe um, uh, Godfrey would like to comment on that. Can I turn it to each of you? You, you first, Godfrey, maybe? terms of being able to distinguish the varieties? Uh, Gaudencia, why don't you go ahead? I think uh, maybe Godfrey can come in later. Sorry, Bob. Can you explain more the uh, question? Because I didn't understand. Uh, there was a question um, about uh, from Dick Tinsley about how much people can tell different varieties of yellow beans apart. And, 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 and at, at all stages, like how, how distinctive are they in terms of just looking at them, the seed or the, or the plants? Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, for G2L, we introduced uyole, uh, yellow uyole uh, from the beginning. So our farmers know that if you want to trade with G2L, you have to produce yellow bean uh, from uyole, which is called Injano uyole. Uh, but by by looking, you can see other variety are big, other variety are small. So for us, we go direct on what we demand. That's why I say we we buy on the quality and the quantity we agree. If they differ from what we agreed on the contract, we don't buy it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe Louise, you might want to comment on that issue as well. This issue of being able to distinguish, which would seem to be an issue right across the system. Right, so um, I will start, but I would love if the Tanzanian colleagues and the breeders, ch you know, um, chipped in. So basically, if you look at, you know, we, we saw at least 20 varieties, I mean, looking phenotypically different. And they're different by shades, they go from white to yellow to brown. They're different in um, shape, some are round, some are more oval. They're different in size. Um, but there are a few which can be confused. So certainly training 
greater awareness of variety differences um, is important. And, you know, one of the things we're advocating and which traders would like is more awareness to keep varieties separate. So to answer um, Dr. Tinsley's thing is that, yes, there is variation in, in some cases. I mean, there's some beautiful browns that are very different from the bright yellows, but there can be mixing. So, you know, inculcating genetic differences, variety differences, among farmers, among traders would be a great step forward. So I love Jeff's idea to digitally, you know, connect traders, you know, connect traders, give them images. Traders can connect with farmers, show images. There are lots of things we can do to get better seed differentiation. We're just starting. Great, thank you, Louise. Uh, let's see, there was a question about well, let me just stop before I ask the next question. Does any of our Tanzanian colleagues want to uh, speak to this issue of distinguishing different varieties? Anybody wants to come in on that? Yeah, having okay. lived in Tanzania, I could comment on that. Yeah, as well. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Louise indicated the really traders they didn't know there's varieties because the consumer is not confused on these varieties. The consumer is demanding. So if you go to the market of the beans in Arusha or any other place, Dar es Salaam, you really find that they've been able to confine, differentiate various varieties which command different prices. Could be some percentage of mix, but it's very little, maybe less than 5%. But generally, the, the, the traders, they really know how to group them as well. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, one of the things that jumped out at me, and I think several of the questioners, is this huge uptick in the amount of seed uh, being produced in, uh, more formally in just a few short years. And I guess I, I would welcome uh, comments on that, and it, it speaks to many of the different questions here. For example, uh, Naomi Sakeni talked about were consumer preferences uh, taken into account? Um, are there other uh, uh, value issues that are driving uh, interest? And so uh, let's see, I, maybe uh, in terms of that huge growth in the, if, in the, um, the Tanzanian system, uh, Godfrey, would you like to comment on that? And then on the seed system growth, Godfrey, and then uh, maybe Eliud comment on the consumer preference issue. All right. Hello. Here okay. you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. So on the question on the consumer preference uh, issue, I think I've uh, seen a number of items on that. But generally, yellow beans are highly preferred. They have certain traits uh, in terms of taste, palatability. There's even uh, quicker cooking, relatively faster cooking. And above all, they have lower flatulence. Flatulence in terms of, you know, not, you know the, the stomach remains comfortable after eating. So this really drive uh, uh, the, the consumer preferences compared to very many other uh, varieties. So overall yellow beans uh, get more preferred compared to the other bean types and you can see it in the different markets. Uh, even among the yellow beans of course there are specific preferences within. So it's not just yellow bean but different varieties that are also preferred in different ways. For example we have the medium round type, of which variant uh, 13 is one of them, or they call them gololi. These are much more preferred compared to the yellow that are hidden type. So then that, those preferences are also taken up by the traders to respond to those consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Um, Emmanuel. In addition. Oh, in addition, oh, sir. Great, Godfrey, come in. 
Yes. Um, you see, these consumer preferences, my colleague has said, uh, consumers are also looking for cooking time. You know, if you can cook longer, so this is not interesting because you use a lot of fuel, a lot of time. So the shorter the cooking time is the better for a consumer. Then we also have some other qualitative traits. A qualitative trait, for example, color. Color is very, very important to consumers. So these days, when you talk, when they see something yellow, uh, is actually associated with also some other other nutrition uh, trait. Iron, high iron, they talk of high, uh, high zinc and so on. But again, taste is also important. You know, some varieties are tested compared to, to other varieties as well. But again, the seed size. You know, when the seed is very, very small, uh, some consumers uh, are not interested. So they are the, the size is also size matter to a consumer. And uh, even the, the breeding program, you have really to start what trades are actually preferred by consumer. Now, in making process, then you have to do it, uh, taking into account this important trait. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe while we have you, got I wanted to add. Go. I want to add on seed. There's a, there's a question asked on seed, Rob. Would you do like to give a background how the seed jumped up? The one of, I was just going to come back to Godfrey on that. Uh, Godfrey, okay. could you say a bit more about what happened in Tanzania that led to this huge growth in the amount of seed grain produced that I think Louise told us about? I, I uh, could maybe. Can, can, can you repeat it, please? I haven't yes. heard you. What, 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 what we you saw. Mean? I think we saw in the data that there was a huge growth in seed being produced by Tusco, uh, the, the Tanzanian seed company, in the last decade, a huge change, uh, orders of magnitude. What drove that? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yes. Um, uh, over, over time, uh, we the also a promotion of these varieties that we have released in collaboration with ABC Fabra, uh, we, see, we see that uh, uh, farmers and other consumers are actually uh, interested in you know, trying to commercialize this. Initially, being was considered as a subsistence crop. Not in these days. Basically, being is really a commercial crop. So you can even see the trend over time. You, you see even number of companies that are producing seed tend to increase. If you compare, for example, 2015 uh, to date, you talk of 13 companies. Is it because now the crop uh, has been commercialized and uh, has become uh, an income, uh, income earning crop compared to the past? Thank you, Godfrey. Um, another question that, that was put on is uh, the, the issue of the uh, shortages of early generation seed. And um, um, who might like to speak to that? Uh, perhaps uh, you, Jean-Claude, if I, if I can pull you in here. Right. Yeah, yes. That's, that's, thanks, uh, thanks, Rob. Maybe coming back to, to that, between 2015, we got a support from uh, from BMGF and and also and also Agra and ISSTP, and we carried them because we had really got got a good varieties which are really demanded by the market through our breeding program with the Tari, and then that's several demonstrations which involved the traders in the demonstrations involving the the seed company which were reluctant initially, but these demonstrations uh, of much stakeholder people coming together, the traders, the seed comp the potential seed company, ASA, Terry, pulled several demand of these varieties. And you can see the growth going up because really that's 
through SSTP and BMGF, we had that uh, grant, which allowed us to cover several areas of Tanzania with this uh, demand pool, and then which brought in the seed demand as well. So on coming back on the early generation seed, it's still a challenge because the demand increased as well. It's not, they used to have a small demand. Asa could not sell their seed initially, uh, even five tons. But as the demand increases, also that's pulled the, the side of the, the early generation seed, which I think for now, Tari alone may not be able to be in position to respond to that alone. So we need to explore possibility of these private enterprises which are coming around now 13, how can they be able to also get uh, that either license or get a breeder seed and continue with the foundation seed and then to support to also in addition to complement what Tari and us are doing as well. Otherwise, the main is in the public sector will not be a good way. And Tari has started because we had uh, several testing of innovations with the private sector to do that. We have now like two or three who are doing foundation seed when they get a breeder seed from Tari and they continue. So it's something which is really developing and we see vibrant industry very soon, yeah. That's encouraging. I'd like to- In addition. In addition. Please, but briefly, just because there's a couple other issues I want to put on the table. In addition, JC has talked about the increase in demand. You see, when the demand increases, uh, this one has also to go hand in hand with the supply. Uh, for example, production of breeder, pre-basic and the basic. So this, the capacity Tari has, you know, we use rain fed to do all these multiplication. Now, if we are to produce seed throughout the year, then we have to think of irrigation system because we know that uh, what we produce, there is a demand somewhere. We also need uh, capacity in terms of storage facilities so that you produce and you can store and when the, the, there is a demand somewhere from the city company, you can easily sell. So the capacity also has to increase uh, the physical capacity in terms of education, storage facilities in order to cope with increased demand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. So for uh, Gaudencia again, Gaudencia, there was a question asking about uh, the fact that uh, companies tend to uh, do, well, first of all, for you, do you only buy quality declared or certified seed? Uh, and then also there was a question from Emmanuel Magno about why are our traders and companies not sourcing uh, material from the research uh, side, which I think we've heard some suggestions that th those research products are, of course, getting out. But and he, he asked, Dr. Manio asked, do they not know what they're missing? So I wonder how much um, understanding of how this is all fitting together is also contributing to the growth that we're seeing. So let me start with uh, Gaudencia, uh, and then uh, maybe Louise could come in after that. Uh, our company uh, prefer to buy our smallholder farmer to produce uh, common beans with uh, certified seed and some from QDAs. Uh, this is because of uh, the lizards, because what we had the experience uh, before when we started this business. We was buying uh, common beans from a uh, different uh, smallholder farmer, whether he buy, uh, he used uh, improved this seed or not. But he, we come to realize that we have different variety of yellow bean. So to minimize or to reduce that, we trained our farmer that if you want to work with G2L, you have to follow what we want because it, it's not a digital one because the market is uh, because of the market. So uh, our farmer now, uh, before the plantation, they ask G12, what variety do you want us plant for this season? So be, uh, by looking for to our market, we suggest to our farmer that you have to use certain kind of seeds, and you can 
source results seed from certain, uh, uh, maybe from Tari Uyole or from the Ula Seed Company, and few from QDS. We are not preferred much QDS because of some challenges which we get, and we have already reported to Tari Uyole. Uh, sometimes you get uh, the, the seeds are too small if you, you use QDS. So that is a challenge for us. So we prefer uh, seeds, and especially from Uyole or Beula. Those are the uh, seed producer which we identify for our farmer to, to buy the seed from them. Thank you. Thank you, Gordencia. Uh, Louise, would you like to comment on this overall issue of how new uh, genetics gets into uh, the system, so to speak, and, and, and what, what's uh, perhaps driving that? You know, um, and I'd like others to speak, so pipe up colleagues. I know there are people also on the chat who were involved in this study, so I would welcome you to, to contribute. You know, at this point, we have a situation where we know some of the processes and not others, right? Let's be honest, and I think we should put this as a strategic research question. How is it that these modern varieties got in so fast? Um, JC and our, our colleagues, Director General, they invite traders sometimes to station. You know, this is anecdotal. This would not give the modern varieties at scale countrywide. So rather than answer the question, I'd like to put it on a research agenda, to be honest. And instead of our saying, oh yeah, the varieties flow from, in, from formal to informal, that's not sufficient. Where do they flow fastest, at speed, at scale? So it's a research question. Thank you. And Eliud, uh, you commented earlier about some of the traits that have really made these beans so attractive to people. I know you handle the marketing end of it, but what insights have you gathered uh, from how how these are coming in to the system? Any comment you'd like to share with us on that? Uh, thank you, Bob, for the that question. So, from from the market side, we have the information from the consumers all the way to the traders, but then uh, that's not all there is. That kind of information needs to reach back all the way to producers and further to the seed supply system and even to the breeders. So by working closely with the different, especially with the breeders and the seed, uh, those in the seed sector, we are able to support this uh, this kind of information from the consumers and get it as part of the feedback, which goes into now programs such as demand-led breeding. These ones are now being grounded on uh, what the consumers and the buyers or users uh, prefer in these varieties. So this is really changing the way breeding is taking place. The way even the seed sector is really working out in such a way that uh, the response time is getting shortened and the products that they come up with are more closer or pay closer attention to what is needed. And if we're looking at the, 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 the products, the products that are being generated, so the, these products are now reflecting what is needed in the market. For example, now you can talk about the yellow bean as a product or maybe the red motor. So previously, these are all lumped together. Now it's getting more and more specific. And I think uh, right. it's likely to have better outcomes. Uh, That's the main theme. That's the main theme. I have to jump in because I have to jump off. And I know we're done with, we're out of our time, but I hope we can continue. We still have a hundred people with us. And Jean-Claude, uh, before I pass it to you, I just want to uh, uh, 
ask you to speak to some of the issues around regulation of this market and and the this uh, synergies or trade-offs between these different sectors. There's several questions like that. I'm sorry to have to run early, but I will uh, I will uh, turn it over to Jean Claude now. And thank you all for your attendance today. It was great uh, great discussion, great presentations. Thank you ever so much, Rob. Thanks, you, Rob. Thanks for your time and thanks for facilitating this interesting session. Yeah, maybe um, I can start by the issue he Rob just raised before he left. Yeah, so what is the legal aspect of this informal trade of seed? I think for now, the legal framework in Tanzania and many other countries does not recognize the farmer, the traders as a source of seed, the grain traders as a source of seed. It's mainly, maybe in Tanzania it goes up to QDS. But um, if you look at it, the, though the law does not recognize it as a part of the legal seed, but I, I think again is also silent to stop because the reality is the seed is there and is being used. So there's no really, any impediment which stops traders because work with the farmers uh, unless it goes again to be packed as a seed that's where the challenge lies but when they they do at the local level the traders are able to sell the seed to farmers because they have arrangement uh, the law does not condemn it but at the same time does not really go to the level of practicality of stopping that to happen, maybe because also the, the aspect of, uh, yeah. So maybe we should be thinking, how do we link the two? Because if you look at the study, it really shows that if you want to move, it's not just a formal loan, it's integration of these two systems uh, to bring in a new variety, to accelerate these varieties and get in the hands of the farmers. So the combination of the two, but if we don't have we don't have a legal framework which allows that to happen. I think that's an area we need to work to see how that can be legally really in the place. Otherwise, for now there is no seed law which authorizes the grain the, the traders to sell the seed which comes from originally comes from the grain. Yeah. So that's what I can say now. Okay. So maybe go to the Concluding remarks, uh, just uh, I would like uh, to thank everybody, uh, really Rob, for, for, for this uh, facilitation. The yellow bean study shows us that the impact of market-led breeding, because I think you talked about it, it's, these varieties, uh, they really have been gone through a process of uh, really engaging the consumer, engaging the market. It's not just any variety which has been released, is that is really inter interaction between the breeding and the, and the consumer. So that's a program we have started for the last 20 years uh, as a PABRA. And we had the deliberate objective to align the breeding to emerging market of beans and expand in order to expand the trade and consumption and ultimately incentivize the, the farmer. Because as Gaudencia was indicating, you could see that yes, farmers, uh, if they do a good, uh, produce a quality, they're able to pay on, on price they agree. So again, the yellow beans again show that the crop research can be harnessed to accelerate trade and facilitate growth for small and medium enterprises the way we saw, and deliver food and nutrition security to millions of farmers. And I think again, trade, that shows how uh, this combination of breeding, seed systems and trade can, can help as well. It also shows that there is a tangible benefit in working with informal. It's only something we can really uh, ignore is very important. It is very efficient. So how do we combine with with the formal? That's really the potential, and that's where we can really do a good work to get these varieties out. So and then meet the consumer and the farmers' demand and address the climate change as Jeff indicated, because really this can help to accelerate the varieties. One of the reasons why these varieties also are preferred is not just the consumer alone. Farmers also like them. Some are short duration, 60, 65 days. So that means if you plant them in a two to three, less than two months and a half, you're able to harvest. Can we imagine that how much farmers will happy to get money in that short period as well? 
Again, also the yellow beans uh, really show that yes, the partnership with the we have uh, as a result of this yellow bean, uh, Tari and Pabra and, and also in the region, we have developed a product profile in collaboration with the demand-led breeding project, uh, which are now has helped us to roll breeding activities to develop better consumer and farmer demanded varieties, uh, yellow bean varieties, which are also climate resilient. So because some of the varieties we have the yellow that's susceptible to disease, the productivity is low. So we have started already to, to, to really to make sure that we have a better climate resilient, but still keep the grain quality as well. And this certainly will expand the possibility of small enterprise like G2L and, and inclusive growth to the smallholder as well. So we also start uh, finishing a similar study in the DRC, which I think will be useful as well. DRC, different from Tanzania, where at least we have a very formal seed system. We have a tari, very vibrant. We have uh, also seed company jumping in. in the Congo, we don't have. But we have also su got surprised that they also, traders are moving these varieties because they're able to know what the consumer want. They're able to see how to get some amount from Minera, the, the, the nuts from there, and then get it to the hands of the farmer. Some of these varieties go through the leaf and traders are able to identify which one has a better uh, marketability and they capitalize on them. So that's really traders, they really play a major role and we'll be sharing this study as well next year as well. So we really see that um, it's a possibility to have a global research like what to, uh, uh, Alliance does, but for this to make an impact, you need to be embedded in the National Agricultural Research Agenda. And I think the DG of Tari mentioned about it, that yes, this partnership is not just something which, there is something which really has been, been built across the years. That's how we can create a really interesting product. And once the National Program Agenda is, is taken into consideration, it's easy to have a policy support, it's easy also to really to get the national uh, government support and also other investors in the private sector and rich millions as well. So, and we are ready to support other crops and other commodity. I think Jeff also talked about it and Louise as well. So for that, again, we thank you for those who supported this, uh, not this study alone, but also the intervention which allowed this study to, to take place. So we think about the donors, we talked about ICR, BMGF, uh, USAID, Canadians and Swiss as well. Several NGOs have contributed the government of Tanzania uh, and the private sector. We really, to th really want to thank you for your undivided attention, you participant. We thank the AgriLink team, which really has been working hard to allow this uh, to happen. We thank the presenters and the research team, uh, which did a good job, and also the bean breeders and other people in Pabra who has done a good job in, in the tari. Also, Rob, for being a good moderator. Otherwise, uh, uh, with best wishes uh, toward the end of this year. Happy holidays and happy new year as well. That's what I can say for now. Thank you very much. Michael. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. Uh, just as a closing reminder, I wanted to direct everyone over to the agrilinks.org website. You can read some of the brilliant blog posts that have been going up related to seed systems all month long. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for joining us. Have a happy holidays and uh, safe travels for all of you that will be traveling for the holiday season. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.